Thank you for joining us. My name is Dick Ko, and today's webinar will be on building an all electric home um, to celebrate Earth Month in 2021. And we, we know there, there's a wide range of um, audience members ranging from architects to homeowners to urban planners, designers, building science experts. Um, so we definitely had to tailor this to cover the, a pretty wide spread of you know, professional and lived experiences. So forgive us if parts of it is too detailed, parts of it is too broad. Again, we just wanna make sure we cover um, a wide range of, of audience members. So with this webinar, what we'll do is we'll have time for Q&A at the end. So if you have questions that come up, please put it in the chat. Um, we will look at that at the end, um, just so we don't um, stop the flow too much. So for better or worse, you'll hear a lot of me talking up front, but then at the end, we, um, my colleague Robbie will help moderate the Q&A. So definitely as questions come up, please, um, please type it into the chat. So again, thank you for joining us and we'll talk about building an all electric home. Here we go. So I'm a worker owner of the Evanston Development Cooperative and the EDC, you know, we, as we call it, and we design and build energy efficient homes for Evanston homeowners and residents. As a community owned worker cooperative, EDC pursues initiatives focused on housing affordability, racial equity, and climate resiliency. So we are a design builder based here in Evanston, Illinois, with a focus on energy efficient and currently 100% of our projects are all electric. And Evanston is committed to climate action. Some of you may live in Evanston, some of you may be Evanston residents or follow what the city has done. Um, we, um, I live in Evanston, so Evanston, and you'll hear, hear me say we a lot, um, but you know, Evanston is the first Illinois city to commit to 100% on renewable energy by 2030 and also carbon neutrality by 2050. So this is the front page cover of our climate action and resilience plan report uh, that came out um, in November of 2018. So we're proud of that work, but that as we many of us um, know, that's just the beginning of, of the work that needs to get done. And we need to focus our greenhouse gas reduction efforts on buildings. Um, I think many uh, on this call and on this webinar understand that's why all electric is important, but I wanna give a little bit more background information. Um, here, a, a direct quote from the CARP report, as we called it, uh, building energy consumption is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in Evanston and accounts for roughly 80% of the community's emissions. Uh, many of us in sustainability, we talk about composting, recycling, bike lanes, walkability, but in the end, what prompted um, Robbie and myself to co-found EDC is really focused on emissions out of, from the built environment. 80% of Evanston's carbon emissions come from our buildings. And if we dig in a little bit more, um, Looking at the building greenhouse gas emissions, um, about a third of it is a result of burning natural gas for heating um, here in the Midwest. That's, of course, as we know, very commonplace, but there's also, of course, electricity that we use to cool and, um, and also operate the buildings, you know, lighting, for example. So in, in order for us to think about carbon neutrality, 100% renewable, in Evanston alone, in a city of 75,000 residents, we need to think about the buildings. And this is a global and national effort. Um, Rocky Mountain Institute, now rebranded as RMI, published this paper not long ago, you know, All Electric New Homes, a win for the climate and the economy. So there's a lot of background information that you can Google and read and see how all electric is a win-win for the environment, the economy, and I would add a third win for the homeowner as well, which we'll see hopefully throughout this webinar. I wanna acknowledge the uh, pilot program that um, our utility uh, ComEd has put together, um, Electric Homes New Construction. It was piloted in 2020, it sent it to 2021. This is a really exciting program where there are incentives for mainly builders and developers, but homeowners, especially in the case of accessory dwelling units, which I'll come back to in a minute, to build all electric, energy efficient and healthy homes. So this is a really exciting effort that uh, Comet is putting together and sustaining going into the future. So we want to highlight that. Before I give you a little bit more about my background, I, and this will give you a hint of my background is 
research, right? Looking at data and how do we see what is the value in going green? Um, Nature is a prominent journal and Nature Energy, this, um, this paper really um, caught my attention is the estimation of change in house sales prices in, in the United States after heat pump adoption. So some of this we'll, we'll talk about more later, but one other thing I wanna leave you with early on is, you know, residents with an air source heat pump enjoy a four to 7% or 10,000 to $17,000 price premium on average when they do sell the house. So the investment is worth it. Um, and I like to tell, you know, people all the time is going green is no longer just altruistic, but it's actually strategic in many different ways. And hopefully we'll um, share more why we think so um, at, towards the end of this webinar. So how did I end up here? I, I received my PhD in chemical physics. I was a faculty member at Northwestern for almost 10 years and was the faculty advisor and director for the Department of Energy Solar Decathlon 2017 competition. Um, House by Northwestern was our team and project name. And many of the people on this call I know are familiar with that international competition. So that was really my entry into the built environment, understanding how to construct a house and why all electric homes are important. So I bring not a building scientist perspective per se, but a different um, role. So that, just to give you some background, because I know there are building scientists on the call and there's also homeowners. So what I think is most important is being able to have a common language and to connect all those dots. And I co-founded um, the Evanston Development Cooperative with Robbie Marcus, who's also on the call. You'll hear from him later as he moderates the Q&A. And we are worker owners of this business. We are a worker cooperative, and you know we're happy to answer those questions later on. But today the focus is really on all electric homes. I'll show a short video, a three minute video of House by Northwestern that will give you sort of video, you'll see the interiors of this all electric home. Um, it's an award-winning home that won first place in market potential, first place in communications, and third place in engineering at the Solar Decathlon. Um, we also won the Student Choice Award for a super awesome house. Um, we won the hearts of um, eighth graders, which is not no, no small feat, I would joke. Um, so enjoy the three minute video and you know, what I wanted to share here is it's all electric is more than just spreadsheets. You know, a lot of us building scientists tend to say, well, if you manage the load calcs, as we call them, you know, all the heating, cooling loads, this is what you got to do. But what we've learned is it's a combination of that and also the design, the materials, the finishes, and also what the homeowner needs and wants and how to fit that into um, their budget, their lifestyle, and also where they live. Um, so I'll, I'll start the video now. The first place award in the communications contest goes to Northwestern University. House by Northwestern is our university's first ever entry to the Department of Energy Solar Decathlon Competition for collegiate teams design and build solar powered houses. With a commitment to human centered design, we successfully created a highly desirable house for baby boomers to age in place. I'm proud of what our students and our partners have collectively done. I'm proud that the university stood behind us and really supported us all along. Oh, so this was a lot of fun. I mean, I, I'm just going to be totally candid here. It was a lot of fun to be there in, in Denver with the students and with, uh, you know, some of the others uh, folks from the community who were involved in building this house. Um, and certainly being uh, there with, uh, with Lanny Martin, the, the chairman of the board of trustees. It was great to be there touring through the house and seeing all the people who would come to this house and just be awed at the, the quality of, uh, of and what, what was designed and what was built by the students in, in, in collaboration with the experts. You could just feel that we were, we were working towards something together. Finally, it was really easy to see it because we were standing in this building that had been on drawings and on whiteboards. Um, I had a conversation with your team in 2015. So I really got to see the evolution of your ideas, right, all the way to the event. And so for us, it was really just a special relationship and seeing how the Schneider offer could really help you guys be successful. I really enjoyed watching the students in their own way kind of take on the responsibility of what they were trying to do. I was very proud of the way that the project was presented to us in the end. 
because I could see that it was something that they would never forget doing. And they, I, I could tell that they had learned a lot. And that's very fulfilling. Having the opportunity to actually work within and with the students directly was huge. I learned that uh, even the seasoned pros could really step back and learn a lot from the young kids that were involved in the project, especially in the form of their dedication and passion to the project. This project, it was just really so reinvigorating, and I feel like I, I learned more than I could have in a class about environmental reporting. I learned, um, you know, about all the technological systems in a house, and I met people on the side of campus that I never would have. And then, I mean, in addition to that, just like so many practical skills about um, communication and marketing, um, and developing a story behind a project. Tell me about the kitchen, specifically this countertop. It's like this sense of pride and like and like camaraderie. I feel the same way as I I think I would feel if I were on like a sports team in college. Like, you know, everyone like looks up to like the football players and stuff. Like I feel like I'm a football player now. I think we not only won in our potential communication and engineering, but we also won the hearts of thousands of people that came to our house. <laughs>
So by looking at bigger homes, we need more energy and that almost defeats the whole purpose of how do we think about all electric and being environmentally sustainable. So what we like to think is how do we build smaller um, and what's exciting from what's happening in Chicago and here in Evanston all over the country is what we call accessory dwelling units. This is a, a housing type that allows us to build new but also build small. Um, they are ex accessory to the main house. So in these pictures here, the big blue house, um, the monopoly house is the single family or two flat, the primary structure, primary home. Um, the existing garage, many of us are, are familiar with the long lots here in Chicago area. By the alley, we usually have a two or three car garage. And then what we call the accessory dwelling unit, the ADU is what's in white. So this is from the Evanston ADU guide that was published just this week. We see different kinds of legal combinations here in, the, in Evanston, whether they're detached or co converting a garage and putting parking outside, attached to a main house, attached to a garage. That white structure can be new construction, can be airtight, can be well-designed. And that we think is a really important start to, um, to penetrate the housing stock and to show people what all electric means, how it's built, build up the workforce. So we're really excited about accessory dwelling units. And as a design builder, that's really what we, what we focus on here in Evanston. Like I mentioned, we the city published this guide called ADU, um, and we're, we are a co-author on that report, um, was generous, generously supported by the AARP. And we worked with the city over two years to pass a series of zoning ordinances, again, focus on how do we allow people, homeowners, to build smaller, giving them more flexibility. We were able to raise the roof height to 28 feet. Um, we were able to re remove outdoor parking uh, from building lot coverage calculations. Um, we, we no longer require an additional parking space for the accessory dwelling units. Um, and we also opened up ADUs to be, to, to be built um, attached and behind all residential structures, not just single family homes here in Evanston. As many of us know, Chicago legalized that on um, in some pilot areas um, recently. And I think as we see that growth, um, this will allow homeowners to think about new construction, which I think we all understand is hard to come by, um, both from a land perspective and also cost perspective. Um, but this also allows us to really think about all electric. Evanston can build thousands of ADUs. Um, we worked with Northwestern computer science students looking at publicly available map data. Uh, a snapshot of it is here. You'll see the alleys, you'll see the front primary structure, the garages in the back. And what we did was we just studied every single lot in Evanston and said, per the underlying zoning district, how much land can we build without needing a zoning variance just by permitted use? What's that square feet left per lot? And how many properties are in, in those categories? So for example, and the x-axis here above you know, 400 square feet, roughly a, a thousand properties can build an ADU with the footprint of 400 square feet. And then as we go bigger, that number decreases. But if you add up all the properties, a three car garage or bigger, we're talking thousands, um, thousands and thousands of opportunities to build. Um, and Chicago has done similar studies and we see you know, in that case, of course, many more opportunities. What we also like about ADUs is that it's, it can be built in all neighborhoods. So this is a plot of where all those properties at different levels of um, building lot coverage to be had. You know, you see it's it really is spread all across our city of Evanston. And we expect to see exponential growth here in the region. Uh, Portland, Oregon is a, um, is a city that's ahead of the curve in the country and um, plotted here as permits issued for ADUs and some of the milestones along the way. And right around 2010 is when they started seeing exponential growth to a point where they're building one ADU per day um, Los Angeles is another fast growing market. So Evanston and Chicago, I would add, you know, we're taking those steps starting in 2017, 18, now 2020 and 21. So we're going to see more demand for these um, ADUs. So many homeowners say, oh, ADU, that's one thing, but I, I came here to learn about what can I do? How do I think about all electric? And so the second half of this presentation is really, again, at different levels of complexity, we won't get into too many details, but just to give us a framework to think about things. Um, 
as many of us know, the home is a complex system. And this is just a cartoon showing from roofing all the way across to insulation. There are different components, systems in a house that work together. Um, and sometimes they work better together than others. And I live in a 110 year old house here in Evanston. And over the years, some things got wired differently and incorrectly or got built incorrectly. So it's just, it's a complex system. And the analogy I like to draw, it's like our human body, right? It, it's just a complex system that all works together. And when we have a goal of being all electric, it's not just circling one thing to fix that. It really depends on the person when it's a health issue. If you have a goal to be healthy, it isn't just do this, right? It is a combination of different uh, from diet to exercise, similar to a house, it's not just one solution. So I want to, I think one takeaway is really to get to understand your house and, and, and set a goal. So we'll go through seven or eight of these topics. Um, but again, the take home message I want to leave with you today is really get to know your home and come up with a master plan. Unless you're building new construction, you would think about all seven or eight of these all at the same time. But for most of us, we're, you know, we're thinking one or two and how do we prioritize? And um, we all have a budget. So let's, how do we figure that out? And then the first step I'll circle and circle again is really thinking about a home performance test. Um, many homeowners ask, what does that mean? But that's really the first test like you would when you set a goal to be healthier, you speak with your primary care physician, you speak your, with your dietitian to really figure out, here's what we got and this is where I want to go. And then from there, you, you do the easier things and do the harder things, the more expensive things. So really that master plan is important for us to develop. Um, so a home performance test is, um, is a blower door test. It involves that, I should say. It, it is what it sounds like. You put a big fan on your front door and you blow air. And from there, you can measure pressure. You can look at cold or hot air infiltrating the house. And that really gives um, the home performance um, expert an opportunity to help you diagnose your house. And of course, looking at the appliances and mechanical systems to know, are there major holes in the attic? Are there insulation where you think they should be? And that's really has to be the first step because there is no prescribed method to what to do to make your house more energy efficient or what your path to energy or all electric uh, home should be. So this really is where we start. There are um, many energy auditors out, out there. We work with Joe here from Insight Property Services. And we just find, you know, find identifying a trusted partner who will help you, again, like your doctor, identify what the issues are, prescribe what the solutions are, and also really be thoughtful in creating a master plan, a step-by-step -step master plan, things you do first and then beyond that. Lighting, um, I hope it's pretty common for people on this, on this webinar to, real, and to, and to realize the, the progress we've made uh, as, a, as a civilization from the initial light bulbs to today's you know, LED bulbs. And some of us remember the compact fluorescent light bulbs in between. And but it's really hard to not buy LED bulbs today based on how cheap they are, how well they, how long they last, how well they work from dimmable switches to also, of course, their, their lifetime. So that's the lowest hanging fruit that all of us should be thinking about when an old bulb goes out, put in a, an LED bulb that looks just like the, the old ones. Um, and then next up, and this is where I would you know, recommend just doing your homework when there isn't an emergency, right? When your furnace is not broken is a good time to look it up. When your hot water heater in this case is not broken, is a good time to do the research to really understand you know, how old is my equipment? Most of us have natural gas powered um, water heaters. You know, how many gallons do I need? What are, what are the latest products out there? What are they priced at? Who are the local installers? And as opposed to water heater breaks today, I have to have it by tomorrow. Emergencies are usually not a good time to, to do that research. And when it comes to water heating, you know, from an all electric perspective is really there are two flavors to consider. One is a, a heat pump, uh, hot water heater where it uses a compressor. It just takes energy, heat from the ambient, from the surroundings, put it into the water to heat it up. 
So it kind of sucks heat from the environment and puts it into the hot water. A um, hot, tankless hot water heater is shown just an example here on the right, uses electricity to pr produce heat and then use that heat to heat up water before you um, before it goes to your shower, for example. There are different ways to do it depending on your need, your sort of gallons per minute and your space. Um, those are different options to consider. Again, similar to a lot of these appliances, really doing your doing the research for fun now because it's not an emergency. Induction cooktops are what I like to joke, not your grandmother's electric cooktops anymore. Um, so you know when it's safe, you could plan a trip to the merchandise mart, test out a few things, see how it works. And it, it really, it, it, technology has come a long way. Again, you know, thinking about cooking in a way that many would like to cook in a way that they're happy with and you reduce the particulate matters in the house by not burning natural gas and having an open flame, but also um, lowering your carbon emissions footprint. Um, so induction range cooktop is another appliance item that's important to think about. And some of the really cool um, appliances I think are a ventless heat pump clothes dryer. Um, this is also not your grandmother's or mother's or father's ventless dryer. It doesn't just heat the, you know, the volume inside the dryer and then exhaust all the moisture and hot air into the, the environment. It really, it uses a heat pump to wick away, essentially take away the, the, um, the moisture from your clothes and there's a, it condenses the water and just drains it. So it drains into where your washer would go. So it just takes moisture out of the clothes and keeps the ambient air um, nice and dry. Um, again, these came really online and became more available in the last few years. So, so that's the research I mean. It's just now it's a fun time to look at it before your dryer dies and then you're out trying to find a replacement by next Monday. Um, is to really have that research done. And this is where I'll share, start to get into some of what we do and coming back to new construction, you know, air source heat pumps, similar to a heat pump water heater, it uses a different technology to, to create heat. Um, and an air source heat pump, they, use, they always sit outside and it uses a compressor to move heat into the house on a cold day. And on a hot day, it moves heat out of the house. Um, and they, these, this outdoor unit is usually connected to a wall unit um, in a room. Uh, many of us have seen them or have them in our homes or certainly I've seen them in Asia or Europe where they tend to be more popular. It's super quiet. You don't need to duct the whole house. These are just those um, similar to what you see those white tubings on the right of the system. You have similar sort of insulated tubing that goes to the wall unit. So it's easy to install. And it operates way below zero degrees Fahrenheit these days to even heat the house. And, and because it doesn't heat up a coil to heat up your air, these things are measured by what we call um, coefficient of performance, COP. And that could be three, which means it's 300% efficient. For every unit of electricity, it moves three units of heat into the house, for example, which as, you know, as we many of us know, a natural gas furnace at best is 98, 99% efficient. So going past 100% required just state of the art, but also off the shelf technology. What's also really different to think about, again, as you weatherize your home, after the home performance test, know where the holes are, you fill that in, just start to think about ventilation. Um, what we've learned is, and many of the older contractors would say, oh, we leave the house leaky. We want it to breathe so you get fresh air, but you're paying for the heating. You have no control over the leakage. What we want to do is to have active control and even better to recover the heat before you exhaust the indoor air you know, in, the, in the winter and heating seasons, for example. So this is a just a cartoon of a energy recovery ventilation unit where uh, on the top right, you'll see exhaust air from the home. It's stale, carbon dioxide, you name it, odor. We want to exhaust it, but before we do that, we use the heat in it that you paid for to heat up the cold but fresh air, warm it up before you put it into the house. And these units are off the shelf. They're smart. They know what to do when it's heating or cooling seasons. They just operate. So then, as you build a new construction, a new unit, this thing about just keeping it airtight and having an er energy recovery ventilation, and also putting into existing homes oftentimes make a lot of sense too. 
So the way we build our accessory dwelling units, ADUs, as, as a firm, as a design builder, we use structural insulated panels. Um, we did a really broad search when I was still a, a faculty member at Northwestern. We identified this partner, Eco Panels in North Carolina, as having one of the most advanced structural insulated panels on the market. Um, there are many reasons, which I'll explain in the next few slides. Some are shown here. Um, on the right, you'll see these wall panels are to be assembled on site. So they come in different flavors, a solid panel, a corner piece, an angled piece, a window cutout, a door cutout. And that allows us to spend more time on the computer. Once we know what we're building, we send it to, to the factory and then we get them flat packed like you see all the way on the left here and shipped to us. What's also exciting to us is the, the corner pieces that you see stacked over there on the pallet they're single solid piece wall corners. So once you assemble the whole house, you can draw a box around it and touch around the perimeter and touch nothing but insulation. So we, we reduce the thermal bridges or how heat gets lost through the studs and the walls. And the thermal images here, I think, tell the, tell the story. On the left here is a green design builder in, in North Carolina in, on a cold day with a thermal, you know, camera, you can see where the studs are. Uh, wood is still a fairly good thermal conductor. You can put it and blow insulation, but you still see where the heat leaves the house. On the right here, you focus on the walls, we do not see heat loss. Okay, so that's one way as we reduce the energy need for this house, we can then have smaller HVAC units and smaller appliances. So then it allows us to go um, all electric more easily. And these panels and you know, in, in putting together this webinar, we wanted to show just, just building and construction methodologies and technologies that work um, to this effect. And so here is a group of Habitat for Humanity volunteers assembling a single story house. So these are bigger than the ADUs that we typically build, but you'll see that they start at 9.18 a.m. in the morning. Uh, if you follow the gentleman in the orange hoodie, uh, he's mainly doing most of the work. And, um, and one panel at a time, you'll see the door cutouts, window cutouts. If you zoomed in a bit, you can see where the switches are. The electrical conduit is in the exterior wall already. And within two hours, um, even with a lot of people just watching, you know, they're able to frame this entire single family house. Right? This allows us speed, allows us performance that I shown, I've shown earlier. And also we reduce um, errors on site. We're not cutting lumber, framing it. It comes um, just, actually assembled once in the factory to test things out and then it gets assembled on site. There are also what we've learned is, and unfortunately the hard way is, you know, our partner EcoPanel has built some structures on um, her, um, on St. John and when her, Hurricane Irma came through about four years ago on this um, resort property, only the structures built with EcoPanels uh, withstood the the devastation. Everything else was just completely destroyed. Um, other structures built, stud frame, light gauge steel. And this type of construction is actually much, much stronger than um, stud frame construction. So with that, what I didn't have, haven't mentioned yet is also the insulation matters. Um, for us, um, we use poly, closed cell polyurethane foam, which is a class one fire retardant. So here is a video where you see Charles Leahy, the CEO of EcoPanels, uh, just putting this open flame on this one inch thick piece of foam. Uh, two things to note, it doesn't burn, unlike polystyrene, and also he doesn't feel the heat on the other side. So this is what we think is the most exciting piece of this building envelope, how it comes together and the performance and what it allows us to do. So to summarize and before we just answer questions is, you know, building small is a big part of this. And as each of us think about our homes is also thinking about more broadly speaking, how do we use our land more effectively and efficiently? How do we let homeowners and property owners be more creative in how they want to live, how they want to provide um, housing for loved ones, how they want to collect rental income to stay in the community. And building small allows us to kind of buck that trend of building bigger and bigger homes, right, which we know consume more and more energy. And the last slide is to coming back to getting to know your home. Um, oftentimes people ask us, what should I do? Well, the answer is oftentimes it depends. It really depends on how 
you know, what state your home is in, where you want it to go, and what projects you have in mind. People have asked, does it make sense to use structural insulated panels when you're bumping out a house? It also depends on how connected is it to the house, how leaky is the house, and what are the mechanical and plumbing systems there. And so it's really about going back to step one, understanding your home and doing a home performance test, a home performance test and energy audit. And all the way down, I didn't talk much about solar. Some of you might have expected us to spend more time on solar, but of course it is an important part of thinking about how do you generate energy on your site? Uh, there are lots of incentives, both state and federal going on in Illinois right now. I, I know it's happening because I see a lot of those ads on my Facebook feed of sign up now. And, and that is important, but I think it's also important to re remember you know, saving and conserving energy is cheaper and easier and just as important as creating energy, right? Not just from a dollar per dollar, but just also the impact it has on the, on the environment. Instead of going out, <clears throat> immediately buying panels made in China or Korea, shipping here, getting it installed, are there other items we should be doing first? <clears throat> and I, you know, I like to end with a dad joke and you know, there are lots of ways to reach all to your to reach your all electric goals and step by step, watt by watt is really how you I would advise people to think about it. Um, so thank you. I will leave this slide here and um, Robbie Marcus, my colleague and worker owner of EDC will um, kind of take a look at uh, or moderate the questions in the chat um, and thank you for your attention. All righty. Hello, everyone. Um, so, so far, we've only received one question, which means that if you want to ask Dick a question, what a great time to do so. Um, but uh, the first question we have is, um, how do air source heat pump noise levels, uh, Dick, compare to standard heating in AC units? That's a great question. And it is much, much, much quieter. And we all know when your neighbor's AC goes on, right? And, and that's a problem. I, people have the windows open, all of a sudden it's a little bit warm, the neighbor turns on their AC, you close the window because it's too noisy and then you turn on your AC. I have an air source heat pump mini split system in our house and I, we can have a normal conversation with our beers on it. It is just a fan that goes, just whizzes. And just because it's such a different technology, it's super quiet. Um, so yeah, it, it's very quiet. So a few people are asking about a recording of the video. Uh, yes, I believe this is being recorded. And um, once we move on to the next question, what I'll do is I'll drop in the chat a link to EDC's YouTube channel. Um, we should have a, a link of this recording up on our YouTube channel, um, probably up by either this weekend or Monday at the latest. Um, and if you get on there, you can also see the webinar we did on Tuesday night with the city of Evanston about accessory dwelling units as a bonus video. Um, so another good question. Oh, they're all starting to come in. Can dryer heat pumps replace current electric dryers? Yeah, I think um, you no longer need a vent. So just making sure you plug that big hole in the wall. Um, and making sure that the energy load, and uh, if anything, I would imagine that the, the, the current and the load would be lower than the existing electric clothes dryer. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, thanks, Dick. Let's see. Um, do Does EDC prefer or recommend home builders in the area? Yeah, I think we, well, what's really important for us at EDC is to create a local, robust, resilient ecosystem of trades partners and builders, contractors. If anything, um, the pandemic has shown us what essential workers are from teachers, post office, grocery store, healthcare providers, and trades partners and construction workers. That these are jobs that we cannot outsource. So then it's really important for us to know and work with um, good um, tradespeople, contractors, and and we, you know, we as a design builder, we focus on standalone efficiency homes. So we like to think smaller, 
um, well thought out energy efficient. So we certainly have partners we can refer and architects, but we also, as a design builder, can take everything from from initial concept to certificate of occupancy. So we would love to you know hear from people if you think, hey, I I, I have a a new construction project that I have in mind. Please give us a call at the number. You can email me. My email um, directly is right there. All righty. Thanks, Dick. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. There's a good question about that actually, Dick, if it's okay, I might answer it. It's on ADU financing. Yes, please um, what kind of financing models have you seen your clients using to build an ADU behind a single family home um, or a two flat, which is also legal in Evanston? Um, there's a detailed breakdown of this in the Evanston ADU guidebook, um, but I would say the three primary loan products we see people utilize are a home equity line of credit, a cash out refinanced mortgage, which is a first mortgage. You pull cash out, utilize a portion of your existing equity and start a first mortgage with a higher principal balance due. And then we also see a renovation mortgage. So the way that works is the, um, the lender looks at your construction permit set, um, assesses the value of the property after construction and utilizes that to figure out how much you can borrow. Um, and uh, the accessory dwelling unit guidebook linked in the chat has very has more detailed information on ADU financing options. Um, all right, looking back into building science, um, Dick, how do these interface with whole house humidifiers? Yeah, and I think depending on how the house, whether new construction or existing, you want to think about your mechanical system. Sometimes we have, you know, an air handler, a furnace, you know, coil, all heating, cooling, and then the energy recovery ventilation on a separate system. And then the humidifier, the whole house humidifier could be part of one or the other. It really will depend on how it's all connected, um, but certainly, uh, whole house humidifiers can be connected to one of the two and maybe some and oftentimes those two are connected right the air handler and the e, the erv the energy recovery ventilation system are connected um, you add humidity in the winter um, you dehumidify in the summertime you can put in hepa filters if you have seasonal allergies like me that keeps our um, our pets um, and you know, we have a friend who has cats and my wife never has allergy issues when we go to his house because they, they have a whole house ventilation system. So those are things that I think when we think about indoor air quality and comfort, isn't just the old way of, oh, if it's hot, keep blowing cold air, but dehumidify to feel cooler and to humidify in the winter. To, so yes, um, that's a long way of answering a question. Yes, it can be interfaced with whole house humidifiers. Awesome. Um, next question. Do you have any preferred equipment manufacturers or installers for heat pumps and or other newer slash innovative products? Yeah, I think back to what, you know, answer I had earlier is I think it's really working with someone local. Um, and then our, our long-term view is it, it benefits the city, the community to have those discussions, right? For your local HVAC installer to hear from you and many others, ah, we want mini splits and we want more of this type of thinking, service, maintenance. So then they feel comfortable to expand that work. And, and so here in Evanston, we have a few that we work with. Um, and a lot of our projects, we work with um, Flater Heating and Plumbing currently. It just And from there, we work with, you know, Mitsubishi um, on thinking about the air source heat pumps and the mini split systems. And we appreciate just that history there from uh, Mitsubishi, one of the leaders in air source heat pumps and mini splits. Again, there are different partners, vendors, installers out there. So that research is important to know what works for you at what price point. And, um, but certainly starting with the contractors you know now is a good start just to let them know, hey, you want it. And as they hear it from more homeowners, they'll realize, wait, this really is um, the future. Awesome. All righty. Next question. Um, uh, maybe Dick, if you go to this slide, could you show the contact info of the recommended energy auditor? And maybe while we're on that slide, we could go to another question. <laughs> um, what's the best way to start to retrofit an older house? 
I think we were looking right at it is to know what you have. Um, it, you'll see and probably get flyers and mailers from window replacement companies saying replace your windows and that's important, but you got to know what's around your windows, right? Does your attic have insulation? And before you spend $25,000 on all these new windows with the thought of, oh yeah, it's going to reduce my energy load. Let's make sure a couple, a few hundred dollars will help you understand with real science, what the issues are. From there, you create that master plan. And then maybe Windows is number one, but maybe Windows is number five, right? You have a few cheaper things to, to do. And then also to do some just home-based tests. Right? I like, you know, I'm a, a chemist by training, so I, like, I love experiments. So one thing I like to tell people is you can get those films from Home Depot or any home improvement store, tape up a few windows in a room at one winter and say, did it feel much, much better that winter? Did your heating bill go down? If so, then your windows can be replaced. That's an easy test to do. And if it doesn't, then hey, maybe there are other things that are going on. And those are could be simple tests that, you know, if you're patient enough, again, not in an emergency mode, can do. Um, that's what we would recommend. If it's really hard to prescribe, do this first. Other than lighting, I think lighting for the most part put in an LED bulb, you get the color of your choice these days. It could even be programmable to the color you want. Um, so that I think is a no brainer. Um, but beyond that is really, you got to know your house. Awesome. Um, let's see, last question I'm seeing. I am an urban planning student trying to help parents thinking about an aging, thinking about aging in place in a non ADU part of Chicago. I would think that means maybe a part of Chicago where they're not yet legalized because there are some pilot areas. Um, can you share resources that might help them develop a master plan? Right now they're very much operating on the emergency replacement model. Yeah, so I think they're, and maybe the person could have follow up with a you know, just to clarify, you know, whether planning a master plan to age in place or a master plan to go all, all electric. Sometimes they're different. Sometimes they're together. So, you know, think about thought about together. But with an all electric, come, I come back to really doing a home performance test. That gives you what you know the sort of the roadmap on what you need to do. And and if, and then from there, emerge and the plan. If it's how do we think about an ADU? Um, Chicago cityscape, you know, they have just, there's great resources and maybe Robbie, you can share a link um, to everyone. Just, just great ADU resources, kind of the go-to place to see um, mm -hmm. that work and being um, documented there to find contractors, especially in Chicago on the ADU side of how do we prepare for that? Um, we, you know, fingers crossed, we see and hope that the pilot areas will be expanded to the rest of Chicago. Um, and for the aging in place, there are also consultants and experts to really help think through how do we age in place, right? Even a three inch drop can pose problems. How do we think about that? And maybe as a family thinking together, what could make sense for intergenerational living? Maybe you know, we get a lot of phone calls these days from home buyers saying, I'm buying this property in Evanston. I want to build the ADU for my, my father to move in with us, but not in the same house. We want to think about aging in place, think about accessibility. So that could be another strategy to think about. Could an ADU, you know, uh, an ADU part of Chicago, in quotes, be a good family plan to um, come together? All right. Well, seeing no more questions, um, that may be it for today. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. And I will go back to this last slide. So again, we you know, we are design builder of ADUs here in Evanston. That's really our, our territory, our focus area, but we're always happy to answer ADU questions or all electric questions from um, homeowners, partners outside of Evanston. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining us and we hope to hear from you again. Thank you everyone. Yep. Um, and Natalie's asking, can we reach out to EDC for more info? The answer is yes. Um, Dick's email is here and I'm also including my email here.
Awesome. Thanks, Ravi. Yep. Have a great weekend, everyone. Yeah, enjoy the beautiful day. And happy Earth Month. And let's all do our part. <laughs>